If you're brand new with us, these are huge because it, it will explain to you some of our values, some of our behaviors. If, if you're new at Ada and you're weeks old or months old, this is one of the most pivotal Sundays, I think, to attend. And people say, okay, I kind of get a little bit more now about what those people are about. Those of you, though, I'm looking at, I see some of you that have been worshiping with us for 12, 15, you know, 20 years. And for you, there's something called mission drift, where over time you can lose sight of core values of an organization. And so it's my hope for those of us that have been around here for a long time, though this might not be new information, to go, dude, thanks. I feel more motivated and more energized and more eager about our future. Thank you for reminding us, you know, the why we, why we do what we do. So jump with me into three defining moments, one in 88, one in 89, one I think was around 94. The first took place in a, basically a ranch house that I preached in for five years of my life, uh, humble beginnings, and a conversation that took place there with a neighbor that was one of the worst days I've ever experienced in ministry, and at the same time, one of the best days I've ever experienced in ministry. Let's watch this together. We decided to kind of go on location to show you this space. Hey, the house behind me was once the home of Ada Bible Church. Uh, the garage doors there, that's where the main entrance was. And upstairs uh, had about 70 chairs for the adults. Uh, downstairs had a couple of classrooms for the children's space. My first five years of ministry were preaching in that room. And uh, that room is also where I experienced one of the most devastating days I've ever experienced in ministry. And my wife, Chris, and I, we lived a couple of miles from here. We're getting to know uh, neighbors on our street. And uh, one of my neighbors, a guy that lived down the block, uh, began quizzing me one day on our church, on the content of my sermons, on what I was preaching about. And it just became very evident in the course of the conversation that uh, he did not know a, a lot about the Bible. I mean, his, his questions were just very, very basic. And uh, two weeks later, uh, I was sitting on the platform, Sunday morning, service is about to start. I'm sitting on the platform facing the congregation. And just before the service starts, the doors open and who should walk in but my neighbor that had quizzed me about the Bible and about our ministry. You think I'd be overjoyed that a neighbor was there, but I started to panic. I started to panic because I had no idea how to start my sermon. Because in those days, every sermon started with the same sentence. Uh, open your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. Open your Bibles to the book of Mark. And all of a sudden, my neighbors there who had asked me these basic questions about the Bible, I didn't know if he owned a Bible. Uh, he certainly didn't bring it if they owned one. And uh, I'm quite confident that he had difficulty finding 2 Corinthians if my opening line was, open your Bibles, which he wasn't carrying, <laughs> to the book of 2 Corinthians. And so I was paralyzed in that moment. And that was before our song leader stood up and said, uh, came to the podium and said, uh, let's all stand and sing the doxology. A beautiful hymn, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. We started almost every service with that song, but he didn't give a page number, didn't say you can find this in the back of your hymnal. The piano player started to play and everybody started to sing, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. And I'm kind of looking out of the corner of my eye, seeing my neighbor and his family just kind of standing around back there, not knowing the words. And that day was devastating for me because I, I realized, I mean, it, it hit me like a board in the face that at that time, Ada Bible Church was totally rigged to further initiate someone who was already familiar with the Bible. But man, if you walked into this place and you were a beginner, you were taking baby steps in the faith, you were going to be absolutely lost. It was awful. And yet it was a wonderful Sunday because... Um, I began at that time to explore and to be asked the question, what would it look like to present the scriptures in a way that were challenging and insightful to someone who had been around the Bible for years, but at the same time to be totally understandable to the person who was a beginner? What would it look like to present the scriptures in a way where they could go, I get it, I get it, it's interesting and I understand it, and it's affecting me, and it's changing me, and that someone could experience transformational teaching no matter where they were coming from.
honestly believe that that was one of the most defining days, not only for who we were, but for who we are as a church. Because that Sunday service where I realized that we were totally rigged to explain the scriptures to the already initiated, started a journey of asking every single weekend, what would it look like to teach the Bible in such a way that would be challenging to the person who has been around the Bible for a long time, but if they invite someone that's a starter, that person isn't lost. And so we decided like to start printing the verses on the, the program so that um, we could say, look, if you've got a copy of the scriptures with you, please find Acts chapter eight, but if you don't, Maybe not all the verses will fit, but you can follow along with us and then putting the verses on the screen because we, we know that some people didn't bring a Bible or don't know their way around a Bible. <laughs> You've been here on weekends before where I, where I start talking about the Jesus material and we show a table of contents, you know, of the New Testament and we circle, uh, read the four books with me, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we say, okay, if you're new to the Bible and you don't know where the Jesus stories are, that's where the Jesus stories are. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different accounts of the life of Jesus. I know some of you sitting there go, dude, most people can probably figure that out on their own. <laughs> I know, but we're sending a couple different signals. One of the signals is, look, if you're brand new to this thing, and this Bible is just a mystery to you, and you have no idea how it works, you are so welcome here. We're so glad you're here and we'll explain it and we'll break it down one week at a time so you don't get lost. That's one of the signals we're sending in doing something as simple as showing a table of contents and circling some books. We're sending another signal too, and this is to the person that's been around here for years, and the signal that you should get is, I can invite. I can invite that new uh, woman at work, I can invite my son-in-law, I can invite my, my, my parents, I can invite my sister-in-law, someone on our kids that travel soccer team, uh, and because I know that even though they may have limited background, they won't be lost. They'll help pull them along. And all of a sudden you go, I trust this place to be able to invite friends. And so we try to define everything as, you know, very rarely do I say something like David wrote. You know, David wrote, in Psalm 23, David wrote, you know, you know, who, who's David? And so you go through these, these drills saying, hey, look, about a thousand years before the time of Jesus, there was a king of Israel, his name was David. In addition to being king of Jerusalem, he was also a songwriter. And we're about to look at some lyrics that we believe he wrote about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And that just tells someone, regardless of their background and training, oh, okay, this is song lyrics and this comes from about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And I learned this the hard way. <laughs> Back when we were meeting in that ranch house structure, there was a weekend where a van pulled in and a group, I don't know, maybe it was like about 10 teenagers came in under adult supervision. It was a teenage adult residential, excuse me, a teenage residential treatment center, all right? And so we, <laughs> we only had like 50 or 60 people in the room at the time, so you would notice if, you know, you know eight, 10 kids came in under guard, <laughs> you know, and they all sat down. And I was talking from Isaiah uh, the prophet Isaiah that day, and so he keeps saying, you know, Isaiah said, Isaiah wrote, Isaiah said, and there was one kid, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, and he was like totally locked in, and afterwards he comes up to me, and he was so excited that, you know, I was talking about uh, Isaiah and what Isaiah had written. Here was the challenge. Remember, this is the, the mid-80s. I was talking about Isaiah the prophet. He had this Isaiah in mind. <laughs> Isaiah Thomas, the basketball player. And it took me like two minutes to figure out that we were not in the same conversation at all, but he was ecstatic that we were reading what he had written to our church. And so uh, <laughs> that's one of those weekends where you just walk out and going like, oh, man, this is not as easy, <laughs> you know, in order to break things down in an understandable way. One of the one of the compliments that we hear, we get to hear this from time to time, is one of the most meaningful compliments we hear is when someone walks up and they go, look, um, I had some church background and, you know, did the church thing, but Bible was really never taught in a way that was understandable. I have learned more about the Bible in the last six weeks than I knew in my entire life. Man, we love to hear that. We love to hear that. It's making sense to me. It's interesting. I understand it. And it's changing me. 
Week after week after week in our teaching time, we really try to do two things well. Thing number one is open the scriptures and saying, this is when this was happening, this was why this was written to them. Understand it in its original context and setting. And secondly, what difference does it make? Thing number two, how in the world is that intended to shape my life? And I'm telling you, when we end a weekend and we feel like we took someone to the story and told the story well and then said, these are the implications. These are the implications. When King David writes song lyrics a thousand years before the time of Jesus, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I refuse to live in fear because you're with me. And how are you experiencing paralyzing fear? And how might God want to deliver you from a life of consuming anxiety? We see it in its context and we bring it over into ours and it can be transformational. That's why I love the story of that guy riding in the chariot and he's up from Africa and he's a smart guy, huge responsibility, secretary of the treasury or whatever, and he says, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. Philip comes, sits next to him and says, let me break it down for you. And he moves from spiritual confusion to spiritual clarity. I love that story. I love that story. And you just need to know if you're on the front end of your spiritual journey or if you had some church in the background but you just never understood the story of the Bible and if it's making sense to you here and if it's life changing, we are so grateful that some important steps in your faith journey got to happen in this space. That is our joy and we're so glad that we get to be part of your journey. It's conversation number one, defining moment number one, conversation, event that took place in 1988 that not only shaped our past, but has infected our present and propels us into the future. It's about hospitality. 